So we think of schools and neighborhoods as being the two of the most important contexts in, in student development. We have a lot of policy attention to these. We have student scholarly literatures. I mean, just if we look at schools, we have accountability systems. We have governance structures. We have teacher evaluation. All that is, is pre premised on that schools are a very important context for student development. At the same time, we have neighborhoods, right? And we have policies and scholarly literature surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the public housing demolitions were done throughout much of the 90s and 2000s with the hope of removing students from these contexts and putting them in better contexts. The moving to opportunity experiment, which, which, which took students out of these public housing projects and randomly assigned them an opportunity to live in a low poverty neighborhood, was all done under the premise that neighborhoods matter for student outcomes. And we have a large literature, um, a, a big part of it's in sociology, but more recently economists have started to take interest in this, that neighborhoods matter. So usually though, when we study these contexts, we study them separately. We look at either schools or we look at neighborhoods. And there's good reasons for that. And, and, the, and the best reason is probably because historically we've had large data constraints that, the re that students were assigned to schools on the basis of where they live, right? And that creates an observational equivalent. You can't separate neighborhood from school because neighborhood determines school. And because of that, you, we didn't have a great understanding of how these contexts work together. What are the relative size of the influence of them? How do they interact with each other? Historically, we haven't been able to gain a lot of leverage on questions like that because of the nesting of schools and neighborhoods. There has been a little bit of work, um, most of it in the past decade or so, that has looked at these two contexts, at neighborhoods and schools, simultaneously. Um, typically, they find that both matter. Um, Tom Cook found that both, that both uh, neighborhood, school, and then also family and friendship are related to student outcomes. Ann Owens, in, in, in recent work in sociology of education, um, found that school and neighborhood characteristics predict student outcomes. And then Roland Fryer and, um, and Larry Katz synthesized evidence from the moving to opportunity experiment in the Harlem Children's Zone, and they provide evidence that both contexts matter, but they affect different dimensions. They found that neighborhoods affect health, where schools are more closely related to academics. So what are we doing in our project? Well, we're building on this line of research that examines neighborhoods and schools together. And specifically, we're trying to do two things. One, we're trying to analyze the relative influence of schools and neighborhoods on student academic outcomes. How large is the influence of the school you attend versus the neighborhood in which you reside? And two, what is the relationship between the characteristics of these schools and neighborhoods we can observe and the student outcomes? How are their contributions related to their characteristics? And, and we'll get into that in a second. So how is our approach different from previous studies? One, we're not relying on characterizing schools and neighborhoods by, their, by what you can see, by their observable characteristics, such as the poverty rate or the unemployment rate, or in the school context, the percent of students who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Rather, we take a value-added approach in that we're trying to estimate the effect of the entire school, the entire, the whole effect of the school or, or the neighborhood. We, we first developed and applied this approach, as Matt said, in the context of Milwaukee. Um, it was published last year in, in the Journal of Sociology of Education. But there are some limitations to the Milwaukee context. Milwaukee is a highly segregated city um, with a, a very small um, white population. It's very heavily African American and Hispanic. And it's not generalizable. We didn't think it was generalizable. That was, a major that was a major limitation. And so we wanted to replicate this approach in a, in a richer empirical context, and, and Wake County provides a great context for doing so. It has a much more diverse population from, than Milwaukee in many respects, not only in race, but also in urbanicity, um, in other in income respects as well. And importantly, it has a student assignment system that explicitly delinks school and neighborhood. Remember, that was, the major, that was the major impediment to looking at how schools and neighborhoods each affected. And Wake's assignment system, which takes kids, which facilitates kids from certain neighborhoods going to a wide array of schools, takes, it delinks the school and neighborhood contexts. So what data do we use? We have student level data from all, all students attending Wake County Public Schools over about a 13 year period. We have the school they attend. We have their test scores. We have demographic characteristics, race, um, disability status, English language learner status, the, the standard characteristics you get in an administrative data set. 
Importantly for this, we know the census tract in which they reside. Um, thanks to some hard work from Matt and, and others at Lake County, we were able to link students to a census tract. And so for those who aren't familiar with census tracts, these are geographic areas that are drawn to reflect true neighborhood boundaries. So if there's a river that determines um, what, what most people consider to be the neighborhood, the census tract reflects that. It, 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 it is drawn to get at socioeconomic and demographic homogeneity and following physical barriers, like I said. The average population in a census tract is about 4,000 people. So it's, it's, not, it's not tiny, it's not like your next door neighbor, your block you live on, but it's a reasonably sized parcel of land. Um, and using this information on the census tract in which individuals reside, we've, we got tracked characteristics such as median income, unemployment rate, um, percent of individuals with a BA degree, and we brought them into our data set. So we have information on the tract in which these students live and the characteristics of those neighborhoods that they live in. So just to illustrate how Wake, how well Wake delinks school and neighborhood, we have, these are the number of schools that kids in a given tract attend over the course of our data. So we have kids in some neighborhoods, some census tracts, that attend 100 different schools over the time period that our data span. And you'll see the minimum, we, we have one tract that, you know, just has, has, has only contributed students to one school, um, and that's an outlier. But at, at a minimum, tracks can, you know, can, the students and tracks attend about 30 different schools, all the way up to almost 150 different schools in a single tract. And that is great analytical leverage for, for what we're trying to do, the separation of school and neighborhood. And here's the same picture for schools. We have kids in a given school coming from 100 different neighborhoods, 100 different tracts. Right? We have kids in some schools coming from almost 200 different neighborhoods over the time period our data span. This isn't a single year, but this is over that 13 or so year period. And so we have this very rich cross-classification, is the term for it, of students in, in schools and neighborhoods. And so what do we try to do with that? Well, for the researchers in the room, here's the technical model, but I'll describe what, what we're trying to do more um, intuitively. What we're trying to do is we are saying conditional on the school a student attends and their test score in the prior year, what is the contribution of their neighborhood, again, taking into the count to the school and the test score in the year they start, what is the contribution of their neighborhood to their test score in that following year? And simultaneously, conditional on the neighborhood in which the student resides, what's the contribution of the school they attend to their test score and, that, and, and their starting point on a test score? to their test score in the following year. So what we're trying to do is isolate school and neighborhood contributions to these student achievement gains, right? So we're looking at what's the contribution of a school to the student's achievement gains, what's the contribution of their neighborhood to their achievement gains, conditional on the other context. So this is more technicality that I'm not gonna get into, but what do we find? So, I'll, I'll, I'll go down the reading um, category. We find a student in the fifth percentile school, so a school that's far down the distribution, learns about, has, has an achievement gains that are about six tenths of a standard deviation less than a student in the average school. On the flip side, a student in the 95th percentile school, so about almost the most effective school in the has achievement gains that are about a tenth of a standard deviation more than a student in the average school. These, this is not much variance for a district of wake size in the quality of school, in, in school contributions. When we did this analysis in Milwaukee, right here we have from the 5th to 95th percentile, the difference is about 0.17 standard deviations. Uh, to put it in more intuitive terms, it's about four percentile points. It's going from like the 48th percentile to about the 52nd percentile on a test. In Milwaukee, this number was about three times this. So it was about 0.5 was the difference between it for a student in the 5th to 95th percentile. And that's really interesting, that the school quality is much more homogenous. It's much more constant in Wake County than it is in, in Milwaukee. But what do we, so what do we see in neighborhoods? We see a student in the fifth percentile neighborhood. Their achievement gains are about nine tenths of a standard deviation, or no, less, 
0.09 standard deviations, not nine tenths, I'm sorry. 0.09, less than a tenth of a standard deviation, lower than a student in the average neighborhood. Where a student in the 95th percentile, it's about 0.06. So if you look at the difference between um, the 5th and the 95th percentile, the least effective and the most effective neighborhood, if you want to think of it in that respect, it's about, it's about three or four percentile points. About the same as schools, right? So living in a 5th percentile neighborhood has about the same effect on your achievement gains as attending a 5th percentile school. So what, is, what are the implications of this? Well, schools definitely matter, right? So in a given year, um, a student in the 5th versus 95th percentile will realize differential achievement gains of about 4 percentile points, but so do neighborhoods. Neighborhoods matter about as much as schools, and that's important to know from a school, dis from a school district standpoint. And I'll note that these are very different from what we saw in Milwaukee, where the neighborhood differences were only about one-tenth of a standard deviation, but those school differences were about five-tenths. So in both contexts, neighbor, both neighborhoods and schools mattered for student achievement growth, but in Wake, the, the relative balance is much more equal than it was in Milwaukee, where school was much more determinative of a student's achievement gains than their neighborhood. And so that has some interesting implications. So the fact that there is less variation in school contributions and weight, we think it could be attributable to, and this is, this is an empirical question, it's one we can test, it could be attributable to a greater focus on equity. The historical a policy of, of, of trying to create rough equivalence in, in socioeconomic composition and achievement composition across schools. That's something Milwaukee doesn't have and is, could be responsible for the highest quality schools being much better than the low quality schools in Milwaukee. In Wake, the high quality and low quality, the highest quality and lowest quality schools are much closer to one another, which is what we thought was very interesting. On the other hand, we have more variation in Wake in neighborhood contributions than we saw in Milwaukee. And we think that could be because there's much more diversity in the type of communities in Wake County. Milwaukee is a highly urban city, and that's all it is, it's a highly urban city. Wake, you have suburbs, you have urban, and maybe even a little bit of rural. Yep. And so the, the, uh, you have the spectrum covered in Wake County, and so maybe it's not surprising that you have more diversity in neighborhood contributions when you have such diversity in the types of neighborhoods that are present in the county. So if we look at how neighborhood contributions, high quality, low contribution, High, high contribution and low contribution neighborhoods are related to what we can observe about the neighborhood, it plays out about as expected. So on this axis, we have the median family income, 50,000 all the way up to 200,000. So there's some neighborhoods in Wake County with a median income of, of almost $200,000, some census tracts. And we see that the estimated contribution to student achievement gains rises and increases as the median income of the neighborhood increases. Perhaps not that surprising, but it's interesting to see that play out on the graph. You see a similar relationship with the percent of adults with a bachelor degree or higher. As the percent of adults with a bachelor degree increases, so does the neighborhood contribution to student achievement gains. And we do that with a couple of other metrics. The percent unemployed, as the percent of, of adults who are unemployed increases, the neighborhood contribution to student achievement gains decreases. And finally, we did that with the percent of single parent households. As the percent of single parent households increases, the estimated contribution of the neighborhood decreases. And so these provide some insight as to the mechanisms that might be at play. How might neighborhoods contribute to student achievement gains? Well, you could have, there's a large literature in sociology about how neighborhoods, theoretical literature and also growing empirical literature, and these are some jumping off points that we hope to explore in the future. So just to quickly summarize, um, we find that both schools and neighborhoods can contribute to student achievement gains. And at least in Wake County, they're about equal in size. The relative contributions in school and neighborhoods are roughly equal. These are for one year. And when you accumulate those across time, 
that's when things can start, you start to see gaps, right? When you have neighborhood contribution, a student is a situated in a disadvantaged neighborhood in one year, well, maybe the, maybe the effect isn't that large, but if that occurs for three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, um, that effect can start to accumulate and become quite large. And there's some interesting research that Felix Elbert and some other sociologists are doing on cumulative disadvantage that, that's, that's relative to, relevant to this. Um, we want to make clear that our results do not imply that moving a student from a low contribution neighborhood to a high contribution neighborhood will increase achievement. The moving to opportunity experiment did just that, and they have found no effects on achievement. Um, neighborhood co context, neighborhood culture is something that accumulates over time, and just moving one student from one neighborhood to another doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to automatically realize the outcomes of the students in the neighborhoods they move to. The observable characteristics, those median income, the, the education, they relate to our estimated contributions in largely expected ways. It gives some face validity to our estimates and also hints at some mechanisms that might be at play. So what, what are we going to do next? And, and Matt hinted at this a little bit. One, we want to look at how students are distributed about, across these contexts. Are some students situated in both disadvantaged neighborhoods and disadvantaged schools? How can Wake's assignment policy mitigate potential double disadvantage? Can it take students who might be in disadvantaged neighborhoods and move them to more advantaged schools to mitigate some of that? Um, we plan to potentially look at segregation levels under different potential assignment policies and more generally think about how assignment policies relate to students' schooling contexts. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Would the fact that the student assignment policy since 2003 have changed three times have any effect on those results? Because we um, went from busing for diversity, then we went to school of choice for a few years, and now it's more based school. So they could very well affect the next steps we look at, but from the standpoint of what we did, what I showed you here, they were actually an advantage because it contributed to the fact that students were cross-classified, that students were situated in different neighborhoods and schools. Um, so that was a feature rather than a bug for what we did today, but for a lot of other questions, it would be a bug rather than a feature. It, it would seem, um, Devin, that the, that the longitudinal study you talked about would be really, really, interesting and compelling I, I, but you didn't mention that as a follow-on I mean looking at looking at the uh, cumulative effects uh, so why aren't why aren't we looking at that um, one is just we have this is this is like the first application of it and so part of it we just haven't gotten to that um, but and and the work on cumulative disadvantage is is starting to proceed and I think it's it's very interesting um, and to look at cumulative exposure to disadvantaged contexts, I think is a very interesting and important question. Um, and that's something I'd, be, I'd definitely be interested in looking at in the future. So, oh, one question of clarification that yeah. leads to a more substantive question. Sure. So the, um, the difference that you observed um, between the high achievement and low achievement schools, that 0.17, mm -hmm. whatever it was, um, and you said that was three times the size in Milwaukee, the third the size in Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, that was uncontrolled, right? Was that just a no, that, so was, that was net. That was, that was net. That was, those were the value-added estimates. Okay. I mean, so I guess, I'm not sure exactly how important this is, but um, I guess it's important like, analytically. But what I'm curious about is, um, do you think that that is, you talk about equity, do you think it's also just a function of how strong a district is, how strong district leadership is, um, curricular control, that sort of thing? Yes. I mean, I think it's a whole host of things. I think equity is probably a part of it. I think it's... Um, focus on on um, the entire district. Um, Milwaukee is, is unique in a lot of respects. Um, and the beauty and the curse of value added is under some plausible, potentially plausible assumptions you can recover causal estimates. The curse is that you have no idea what's explaining those estimates. And so I think there would be a lot of interesting work to be done about, you know, across different contexts, what can explain differences in variability. We focus so much on the mean, on the average, but I think variation is a is at least as interesting a, a parameter as the mean. So um, can I just yeah, sorry. please, please, please. If you were to do it just descriptively without the controls, would you find the same thing as are, are, are the big schools? Um, 
Yes. Just just for people who are one other than the public schools. Yes, and part of that is due to the assignment policy explicitly trying to um, have no more than I, I can't remember what the exact percentage of students below grade level, but that was an explicit part of the policy throughout the 2000s, and I would say that's likely to be a contributor, um, but I don't know that with certainty. Other questions. What was the, um, the time frame for the Milwaukee paper? Milwaukee paper was 05 to 09, so it fell squarely in the middle of, of this time frame. We have about five minutes. So I'm curious, um, I would expect so the sort of random assignment from a high income area to a low income area a little bit of a selective sample, which is the high income area if they're assigned to an underperforming school, I expect them more likely to access the school system. So I'm wondering if that underestimates the, uh, the impact of a bad school in some sense of rich kids. Can you say that one more time? So you know, there's kind of these catchments and the kids sure. are assigned to the schools, and I would expect rich, uh, rich kids assigned to underperforming schools to disproportionately opt out of the school system. And so this means I'd expect to see very few rich kids uh, sort of, so in the sense of the school effect, the impact of a bad school uh -huh. on a, a neighborhood effect. And I expect you're missing a lot of these kids who are. That, that could be. Um, we did not look at the characteristics of any given school in this, in this analysis. We used the student level data, but we didn't look at, we didn't take into account who left which school, who, who opted into each school. We took the schools as they were um, attended, and that the, the, situ the scenario you play out, you, you lay out, could very well be true, that these are underestimates, potentially, um, but we, we didn't look into that. By the way, thank you for your, your presentation and your work, and it's very interesting and, and creative uh, analysis. Um, I was wondering if you speculated anything in, in any way about how these effects are being operationalized, uh, if, like in the neighborhoods. I mean, what, why? Um, I have any thoughts on that you could share with? Me? So, um, so I, I think there's a few different possibilities. One is peers, um, just who, who you you know your peers in school might be different from your peers in the neighborhood, especially when you have cross classification, and you know. You can have one set of peers in school, one set of peers in neighborhood, and that could, and we know peers matter for, through a whole line of research. So I think that's one. There's a line of work showing um, resources availability in, in neighborhoods differ greatly along socioeconomic characteristics. So things like libraries, things like parks, things like after, you know, alternative out of school education opportunities. Those, the, ability, the offerings of those vary dramatically across, um, across neighborhood. And one other thing that's just now starting to be explored a little more is um, the relationship between neighborhood and health. So disadvantaged neighborhoods are often older. You might see lead paint. You might see there, there's some work showing that disadvantaged neighborhoods are disproportionately more polluted neighborhoods uh, or in more polluted areas. And so there's, and then there's evidence that you know, asthma and hospitalization, and so that the, the links between neighborhood advantage and and poor health outcomes is is strong, um, and so all of those together, we can't dis we can't distinguish between any of those, but all of those are possibilities. And if you look into the literature on on neighborhood um, effects, you'll routinely see resources, peers, um, and and health as three potential explanatory factors. But I think I think those mechanisms looking into those in the future again, it'd be really fascinating to know what's what's contributing and that's you know, that's the drawback of what we've done. You mentioned earlier that you um, took into consideration the fact that Wake has so many magnet schools and students so students aren't necessarily attending the school in their neighborhood? Yes. So we, okay. we take into account the school they attend. Okay. Um, in our analysis, that's that's an important feature of it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. When thinking about keeping neighborhoods and schools you talked about earlier, how do we begin to think about evaluating programs like Promise Neighborhoods and um, 
some of the concerted efforts among counties to coordinate services between social services, police departments, to kind of impact school mm -hmm. outcomes. So this this is not um, advocacy for delinking. It was taking advantage of the fact that they were delinked. Um, the reality is in many places they're not delinked. And so in those sorts of places where you have promise neighborhoods, it makes a lot of sense to try to do that. And I think it's an open question as to whether it is it would be more effective to try to delink those or to try to deliver services in, in, in the context where they're linked, where you have wraparound services at schools, right? I mean, those, those are both plausible strategies to improve outcomes for, for disadvantaged students. Um, which is superior? I don't know, and, and I'm, I'm not sure there's any good evidence on that. So I think it's a really interesting question. You know, if we take a promised neighborhood approach, a, pro a Harlem Children's Zone approach, that's going to produce one set of outcomes. If we try to simply remove students from disadvantaged schooling context via assignment, via whatever else, that's also going to have some other set of effects. And how those compare, that's a really interesting question. And I don't think it's not. I don't think it's one that's been answered really rigorously. Yeah. 